So welcome to this roundtable of the Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, on en energy transition today um, on the uh, aspect uh, of uh, gas um, in the, or the of the gas delivery uh, in the European Union uh, in light of the, the current uh, situation. Um, there is a translation uh, being uh, served uh, in the system here at this Zoom conference, so you can either choose German or uh, English. Um, uh, and uh, so either you stay on the floor or the, the, uh, um, the respective language. Um, willkommen uh, zu, dieser, uh, zu diesem runden Tisch. Um, A warm welcome to this round table discussion of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. It's about the energy transition, um, gas supply in the European Union um, during the times of war in Ukraine. I'm thrilled to have you here. We um, offer translation interpreting services. You can choose um, the language that suits you best, or you can, of course, uh, follow the original. I'm Jan Philipp Albrecht. Um, I've just started as one of the new presidents of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. This is one of my first events in this role. And I'm delighted to be here with you um, and to introduce um, into this event. We have a certain tradition as the Heinrich Böll Foundation. During the last years with our partners, we organized events about the energy transition uh, between the European Union and Ukraine. So therefore, this is uh, some kind of uh, continuance um, and um, we uh, um, have, of course, a very uh, different situation now. The context has changed completely, um, but um, we know that this um, uh, is not just um, about uh, geopolitics or uh, geostrategy. Um, but we have a new situation um, because of the attack, um, of, because of Russia's attack against Ukraine, and um, which is also against the international law. Um, so um, this is a war also um, of extermination. We see that Putin fights against uh, Ukraine um, and uh, denies um, its existence and denies uh, their culture, so um, it's an, it's some kind of imperialistic um, war um, using force, um, force and um, and the right of force, and it's against um, the international law, and um, and so this is a threat to the general security politics in Europe and in general to the international context, this war is not only against Ukraine, but also against democracy and freedom and the rule of law in Europe and um, against uh, um, the international law. Therefore, we need a European uh, answer in solidarity with Ukraine and um, especially when it comes to the energy sector, um, which is um, a very critical issue and it's also about the role um, in this conflict when it comes to the European Union, but also, of course, when it comes to Ukraine, the uh, export of fossil fuels to the European Union during the last decades have help to strengthen um, the authoritarian character of Russia and this unilateral dependence of the European Union um, makes it more difficult to react and to respond to this invasion. This is something we are dealing with um, and in this um, has also been a topic in recent years. Um, there have been voices that had criticized this uh, um, 
dependency when it comes to energy. So we are in a very difficult situation. Um, we've seen um, a short um, a change that has happened very uh, quickly. And the government of the Federal Republic of Germany and the European Union have started to react and uh, have started to find ways out of this dependency. So you know, we are um, thinking about the next steps how to offer new perspectives and new angles. Um, 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 and in light of this conflict, uh, we want to talk about this. We want to have a debate on this. So I'm excited to have you here um, and to uh, go deeper into this topic and to discuss what to do next in the gas uh, sector. and. Uh, I'd like to thank you in advance for all the um, ideas from our friends and partners in Ukraine, and also a warm welcome to Yaroslav Demchevkov. Um, he's the Deputy Minister of Energy of Ukraine. Uh, we are happy to have you. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. And we'd like also to welcome all the other attendees, all the other participants. And um, they will, of course, address the topic too. Robert Sperfeld is our facilitator. He specialized on uh, Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe within the Heinrich Bölsch Foundation. And as I've said before, I'm thrilled and I'm looking very much forward to this debate. Thank you so much, Jan, for this introduction and for the for the welcome um, address. So um, I've been introduced, and um, I'm able to um, take it from there. How to manage the situation? How to find a solution? And um, uh, in the light of this terrible war, um, this invasion. So this is the 99th day of the invasion of the war. Um, so, and this is um, a large scale invasion. We are going to address this today. This is a week where the political debate within the European Union has focused very much on the oil supply. So the council has taken a decision today. We are looking in a, we are looking especially towards next steps. We'll, we are having a focus on the sector where the dependency, where Germany's uh, dependency and the dependency of the European Union is, is um, um, very um, big. So we uh, we have seen tw uh, that um, the EU has paid $20 billion. Uh, this is to Russia. And this is, of course, something that contradicts um, uh, the sanctioning uh, against Russia. And so we um, have heard about the, with regard to the oil, about the difficulties with regard to uh, the decisions. So it won't be easy when it comes to the natural gas. Germany is the, the Europe's largest economy. So it's one of the main actors in this issue. So we would like to focus on Germany, but in, in the context of the European Union and beyond and the European Energy Union with all its other partners, including Ukraine. It's so we want to do it together. And we want to focus on this together. It would be absolutely wrong to focus on uh, a nationalist uh, angle to this topic and um, compete within the countries uh, within the European Union and its countries. So we want to look at the um, fields of action on our options um, of action and how to repower the EU. Um, we'll talk about this repower the EU package. It's about the targets and goals of efficiency. Um, 
we it has been um, proposed to introduce an energy platform with regard also to hydrogen and, and to do this together with the partner um, countries uh, together with Ukraine. So this is more or less the framework of our debate. So um, I'll stop here and uh, I'd like to address how we will proceed. We have three sections to this event. We'll have introductory statements of uh, Yaroslav Demchenkov, of the Vice Deputy Minister, and um, then uh, we'll have um, Ms. Ingrid Nestle, member of the German Bundestag, um, and um, Mr. Demchenkov um, has to leave us a little bit earlier, so we'll um, open an op uh, um, um, a round for questions um, immediately after his part and his speech. So you are very much invited to use the chat. And then in the second part, we'll, we talk about the economic impl implications about the reductions of imports, of um, or a stop, a, um, a limit to the imports from Russia. And then we'll have a third part dedicated to climate uh, protection and the, um, the real agenda. And um, the speakers will be introduced. And um, I'd like to start with uh, Yaroslav Demchenko. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you for being here. Uh, he's uh, since May 2020, the Deputy Minister of Energy in Ukraine and responsible for the EU integration and uh, for uh, the gas sector. He worked in different roles um, within UN projects, for example, and then we'll have uh, Dr. Ingrid Nestle, the spokesperson for climate and energy of the Alliance 90, the Green Party um, of, Germ uh, in, of Germany. So I'd like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Demchenko. So a warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I do appreciate to be here with you. It's an honor for me to give an opening speech. I must warn you, I will take a little over five minutes as was planned. Almost two years before the war, we launched a new energy partnership with Germany. We identified five areas which were proposed, uh, supposed to help our countries achieve uh, energy transition, decarbonize uh, the energy industry, and launch new projects of common interest in the field of green energy. Almost two years before the war, we were trying to persuade Germany that Nord Stream 2 was a project aimed at uh, increasing Europe's dependence on Russian gas and an instrument of the Kremlin's geopolitical game. We were saying that after this project completed, Russia would invade Ukraine. And so it happened. The post-Merkel period promises to become quite intensive. New goals of decarbonization are joined by efforts of deoccupation and demilitarization. As of mid-May, Russia has fired more than 2,100 missiles on Ukraine. Dozens of settlements turn into ruins. Energy assets are a frequent target of military attack. Missiles destroy critical infrastructure. More than 5 million people were cut off from electricity and half of a million from gas. Trains, losses from Russian armed aggression are estimated at hundreds of billions of euros. 
the energy sector has suffered uh, terms of billions of euro of in losses and hundreds of billions of euro more in new losses every day. According to the Institute of International Finance, Russia's budget revenue for the four months of this year increased by 3.4 times, from $39 billion up to $133 billion. A largest portion of this growth come from export of Russia energy. Europe is the largest buyer of Russian energy, and Germany, unfortunately, is the largest buyer of Russian energy in Europe. Germany imports from Russia in four months of 2022. This year, the year of war, increased by 57% year on year. That is why we appear to our German friends and partners to limit the financing of the Russian budget, which uh, finance the Russian aggression against Ukraine. The lion's share of this import is Russian oil and gas. That is why it is possible to significantly reduce Russian's budget revenues without restriction on oil and gas supplies. We understand that the German economy needs significant and reliable energy supplies. And we understand that Russia has been working for decades to make it difficult for Europe to replace Russian energy. It's also no secret that exploiting this dependence, Russia caused uh, an increase in energy prices in Europe even before it inventioned Ukraine. Last year, Russia's Gazprom stopped filling underground gas storage facilities in the EU in sufficient volumes. And with the coming of winter, it reduced gas supplies to a minimum, which led to a significant increase in its price. As a result, European gas prices have excited even prices in the Asia market, where gas is traditionally the most expensive in the world. We often hear talk that Germany is receiving extremely cheap gas from Russia, and so switching to another sources of supply will lead to a significant increase in utility prices German consumers. However, Germany's expenditures on Russia energy import has increased while the volume of gas supplies by Russians to this market has been declining. We are also aware of the significant rise in utility prices for German consumers over the last year and the closure of several suppliers and producers due to rising gas prices. This means that the argument about extremely cheap Russian gas for Germany is a manipulation. If some additional concerns have access to special prices for Russian gas, these benefits do not translate into benefits for or, uh, ordinary consumers, and the rest of the economy. It also means that replacing Gazprom with other suppliers will not have such a devastating effect on consumers' bills, as we are, as we are often told representative of these entities. We are probably already paying a higher white market price for gas and heat. It would be in the interest of the German economy and consumers to get rid of dependence on a soil supplier, Gazprom, which was not behaving in a business-like uh, manner, even if Russia had not started this bloody aggression against Ukraine. Diversification of gas suppliers 
will also allow Germany to stay more energy secure. That is why we have proposed to Germany government, to German government, uh, a series of measures that could help solve the problem without significant negative impact on the Germany, German economy. Our approach includes several stages of abandoning Russian energy, which will give the economy time to adopt and uh, switch to other sources of energy. We have also proposed the introduction of financial restriction, where rapid rejection of Russian fuel is problematic. In addition, Ukraine proposes to replace a large share of Russian fossil fuels with electricity from our Ukrainian generation. Due to the Russian aggression in Ukraine, the demand for energy has significant dropped. In. We have a supplies uh, of electricity, uh, including a share of carbon free generation at most 70%. Such energy will strengthen German security of supply while money paid by German consumer will go to support Ukraine, not Russia in this war. A significant amount of Russian gas can be replaced by Ukrainian electricity. I would like to know that Germany will help us with the installation of the necessary equipment to expand Ukraine's capacity to export electricity to the EU countries. We have unique potential to build additional renewable capacity after our victory, including on energy sources such as hydrogen and biofuels, which is in line with the Repower EU plan. Also, let's not forget that uh, Ukraine has the largest underground gas storage facilities in Europe and the lowest price in the EU. On gas transition, transmission system has interconnected, our gas transmission system has interconnected to the markets of Central, Eastern, and Southern Europe. Thanks to the uh, thanks to this uh, instruction, Europe can make a, a, a giant leap towards independence from Russian gas. The total storage capacity of our capacity of our storages is almost uh, 31 billion cubic meters. We can offer half of the available capacity to European companies for their seasonal or strategic gas reserves. Together with Polish and German energy terminals, Ukrainian storage facilities can become a key component of the region's new architecture of energy security. We are glad that the German government and businesses are willing to hear us and are showing readiness to boosting cooperation in the energy sector. We are grateful the German government for the intentions to reduce the dependence on Europe's most powerful economy on Russian energy. Dealing with the dependence is very uh, rational choice for uh, Germany and the whole of European family and will benefit businesses as well as household, uh, household consumers. Yesterday's statements of Chancellor Schultz during debate at the Bundestag and decisions inspired many Ukrainians because it gives us hope that we will be able to repel Russian attack. Now I would like to wish everyone a nice and productive discussion. It should be an interesting and timely subject talking about different instruments that can be used to strengthen energy security in the EU. And afterwards, I will appreciate it if the organizers could summarize the key takeaways that will uh, emerge in this course of today's discussion. And our ministry would be happy to have uh, feedback and proposals uh, from, from, from participants. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Many thanks to you. Uh, vielen Dank uh, an Sie. Uh, Thank you so much, Mr. Benchenko, uh, for this introduction. So we are um, going to have a second part of an introduction given by Ingrid Nestle. So I'd like to invite the audience to use the chat in order to start and raise your questions. So I'd like to give the floor to Ingrid Nestle. She's the spokesperson for climate and energy within the uh, parliamentary group um, of the Alliance 90, the Greens, but of course, this is a topic um, which is very much debated within Germany's parliament. Um, Ingrid, maybe you can give us some insights what has been discussed during the last days. Uh, yeah, of course, I'll do so. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Mr. Demchenko, for being here, for giving us um, your um, opinion, um, some insights um, into the situa in situation. This is a terrible war uh, started by Mr. Putin against the people, against your country, against um, our fundamental values. And we are on your side. And we've talked, we've heard about the um, energy politics. This is one of the fields where we need a very decisive response and um, we are on our path uh, step by step we we want to become independent from energy supply from russia it's um, when we look at the physical quantity we have already begun to reduce it um, you've mentioned uh, the money involved we are st we still have to work on that to reduce this this is also about other sources of course we have to use um, which are more expensive we have to buy um, then um, gas and oil there and um, there are also contracts involved and um, and the um, uh, the, the prices on the market play a role in that so we have to pay more on the market so but we want to reduce the quantities of course we have to we uh, we have passed uh, some bills uh, since the war has started um, in order to become more independent you've talked about the storage and and uh, how um, Russia used its storage in our within our own country. Uh, we have this energy protection bill um, where it comes to find a solution to um, Russia having also its tools within our country. Uh, Mr. Ha uh, Habeck um, has acted um, um, and sold gas from Germania, um, and um, they wanted to do some harm to us. Um, and um, and um, so we found a solution, and uh, we uh, we have uh, passed a, a draft bill on um, acceleration um, of um, energy um, of the energy transition. It's about LNG terminals. It's about finding diversification. Uh, we buy energy from where we are able to buy it, um, and. Um, and, it's, uh, and we're also focusing on using energy terminals in other countries. It's also for uh, that um, we are working also on um, uh, power plants, coal power plants. We would like to readdress them into the market in order to be able to not depend on gas. And I'd like your proposal that um, that there are capacities that uh, could be supplied to us. Um, so this is quite a range of builds um, who um, are supposed to help us and, and shall help also Mr. Habeck. So we are the legislator as the parliament. We are working intensively on this issue. We are working on this route towards independency. It's a very important day. It, 
in, um, when uh, we'll focus, of course, on the renewable um, resources. This was also on our agenda. And we also want to become independent from fossil fuels. Uh, we have a climate crisis. We have um, a very demanding agenda um, about renewables, uh, um, a new bill is planned. We want to work on that next week. We're looking forward to do so. We hope that it's doable within the next. It's also about the diversification of energy and to have a more eco-friendly supply. And um, and we are work, we work on another uh, proposal in order to amplify the electricity grids. We have to accelerate this too. Um, we, of course, are facing the difficulties uh, posed to us by the war. Uh, this is a terrible war, a physical war, but it's not only um, a war um, in this sense, it's also an, an economic war and it tries to harm us also with extremely high pricing. We we see it's difficult to have extra additional storage also in neighboring country or to buy from neighboring country. We see this also with regard to southern Germany and we see that the grid is also under a lot of pressure. So there is a necessity to work on that too. So uh, it's a lot uh, we are working on and um, and I've been asked also to address the challenges. So we uh, want to reduce the consumption, which is really high. There is a, a high potential for efficiency and for reductions. It's um, also quite difficult to work on that because it applies to different branches and sectors. So I think there could be a third link to uh, the suffering. This is what is going on in Ukraine. Everybody, each entrepreneur, each um, individual, they can work on that, become more aware of the issue. Another challenge could be you've talked about that. We have we are quite um, we are facing quite high energy pricing. We see it, um, with. Um, we, we see um, a, a link, uh, the, pr the pricing is high because we want to support Ukraine, but we, we are also facing this economic war by Mr. Um, uh, organized by Mr. Putin and he tr tries to drive the pricing up and he does it with a certain kind of intelligence and smartness. But of course, sometimes this um, is lost. Of course, we absolutely want to support Ukraine and we want to um, stand against Putin with you. But of course, we see the pricing going up, uh, but then um, um, it's, there's, there is maybe also not enough awareness that there is this link because there's too much time in between. And then when faced with these high prices, um, it doesn't help um, cohesion in society. And another challenge is about the quantities, the energy quantities. So we have to pay more. And then, of course, we pay more to Putin. So um, we see it um, via the world market. So the offer on energy is static, even if the prices are driven up. So um, everything is been extracted and goes to the market. And um, we try to buy what is available. And we want to, of course, to be safe next winter and to become independent um, from Putin. So this is the situation. So we see um, that there are a lot of buyers and they are competing um, and um, also with regard to LNG that has been cheaper before. So we need smarter answers. Um, it has to be buyable and payable. We, of course, we don't want to waste our money, but it's also about the international solidarity. This is something that happens to all the countries and other countries are even facing more problems. So this is it from my side. So I'm very much looking forward to the debate. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ingrid, for your kickoff. And uh, so I just have one question in the chat, and uh, maybe we can uh, gather further questions. 
if I'm not mistaken, the question goes to Ingrid uh, Nestle. But I would like to come in with a question with uh, regard to Mr. Demchnov. Uh, let's talk about the cooperation in the energy market, possible future procurement or joint procurement, which was proposed by the EU Commission. I.e. building a joint energy platform. What do you think about it from the point of view of Ukraine? Could this help strengthen energy security in Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, indeed, this is very important. Uh, this particular period of time increase uh, the level of our energy security and uh, keep the uh, energy system at the level of necessary level of resilience and provide uh, affordable electricity and heating for our consumers, uh, for our people. Uh, and also the we uh, now think about uh, post-war recovery uh, preparation because we have a lot of uh, challenges uh, in this particular period of time during war to, 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 to implement a lot of uh, uh, recovery prog programs, repair programs uh, uh, in different, in different uh, cities, towns, but we also think about uh, post-war recovery. And here we believe that could have a good cooperation with uh, Germany. First of all, uh, talking about the uh, future of Ukrainian energy sector and uh, about recovery, we do not need to uh, was as a Soviet area legacy with low efficiency that does not match the needs and challenges of uh, the 21st century. That's why uh, experience of Germany companies and energy efficiency in uh, usage of new uh, technologies uh, could be very sufficient and important uh, after war period of time. We will not spend time, our time, and time of our international partners, as well as not uh, spend uh, money for restore uh, objects and facilities that become outdated uh, 20 years ago. We will intend uh, to use the latest technologies, and this is uh, a very good uh, opportunity for Ukraine uh, to rebuild the uh, Ukrainian energy sector more modern, more, uh, more progressive, more efficient, uh, as a better and sustainable version of, of uh, itself. Of course, uh, right now we have a lot of uh, ongoing challenges, and uh, for this uh, uh, for, for this purpose, we are at the beginning of April of this year, uh, together with Energy Community Secretariat and uh, with European Commission, launch the Ukrainian uh, Energy Support Fund, and this fund accumulates all grants to Ukraine. Uh, represented by the Ministry of Energy, transferred by different donors to a special account. And the purpose of this fund is to deliver uh, available financial support from international donors to the Ukrainian energy sector, especially by providing uh, capital to the energy companies that are not able right now to find the funds to pay for their most urgent needs, procurements in the time of war. And we have very good cooperation within our Ukrainian and German uh, energy partnership with uh, German businesses. Uh, and uh, right now we are waiting for first uh, delivery from Germany, necessary uh, emergency equipment uh, 
uh, spare parts uh, as a gear. We also will work with Germany uh, and our went working with Germany uh, regarding uh, fuel needs uh, to generate heat and electricity. And of course, uh, this is very important for us to implement repair or reinforcement and other services during this particular period of time of war. And of course, uh, you understand that uh, our energy facilities should be ready for winter period of time. And now this is the second challenge to be ready for uh, winter, uh, to have enough uh, fuel, but also uh, all facilities, all uh, grids uh, should be ready for, for, for this particular period of time. And I know that the government of Germany uh, uh, finalized decision and uh, some uh, quite quite uh, good amount of funds will be uh, delivered will be transferred to this uh, fund from from Germany and we hope that our international partners procurement agencies will uh, uh, spend this money uh, uh, in transparent manner and uh, we will have emergency procurement and we will have needed needed equipment so that's why first of all our uh, special thanks to the government about this decision to provide funds for uh, uh, for uh, this uh, uh, fund, the Energy Community Secretariat Fund, and for all businesses, for companies, for uh, different uh, German uh, institutions, for first uh, uh, delivery of equipment. Uh, and we are hope that uh, uh, war will end in the nearest future, and we, we, could, we will start uh, a new activities uh, regarding uh, rebuild Ukraine better past more uh, recovery from this. Uh, so that's uh, that's all from my side. Ja, äh, ja, vielen herzlichen Dank, dass Sie auch gleich auf die Zusammenarbeit auf die äh, deutsche Ukraine Okay, thank you uh, for mentioning the German Ukrainian cooperation in the field of energy partnership. Now you now we have a range of further questions. Now looking at the time, I would like to postpone uh, the rest of the questions for later rounds. But maybe we can make an exception. The first uh, double check in question going to Ingrid. Um, she wanted to know it's a trade off uh, coal and nuclear. So this was just uh, double checking what you said in your keynote. So what is better, coal or nuclear? So try to be brief. We are behind schedule, but you will take the floor later on again. Right. Uh, it's always a question you need to answer in the real context. And we don't have the join between nuclear and coal. Minister Havek really checked this, whether it makes sense to prolong the nuclear power plants. And it really means something for a minister belonging to the Green Party to check this, where we can't get any new fuel roads for the new winter. They are spent. We still have three nuclear power plants and bringing them back online is going to be very difficult and uh, parts have been removed, you can't just buy them. And we don't have the staff and continuing uh, to prolong them would just give 5% of our power and 1% of our primary energy demand. And we wouldn't be able to off produce more uh, fuel if we extend the uh, duration because the fuel rods are spent. I mean, it was just lead to a postponement, uh, but it wouldn't help us. We have massive gas storage. However, uh, we have a problem. Uh, so it's no good that we use gas to produce more power in summer and then less in February, but it's more about uh, how much uh, we, gas we turn into power. Maybe next winter we could get fuel rods again, but again, they would come from Russia. And 
then lengthy security checks would have to be carried out again. But they were suspended because the nuclear power plants will be taken offline. And if they go online again, it would be very laborious. And therefore, we came to the conclusion it's not worthwhile. Thank you very much for this clarification. It's a question that crops up very often. And uh, we moved away from the gas issue, which was supposed to be in the focus. Uh, so we straight off topic after this tangent. Let's move on to the second part and warmly welcome Casimir Lorenz and Gerard Sachmann. Casimir Lorenz is an energy economist, a principal at our Aurora, en Aurora Energy Research, and uh, he worked for the German Institute for Economic Research, conducted research, and Georg Zachmann, senior federal, uh, he comes from a uh, senior fellow at Bruegel Think Tank, and he works on climate and energy politics. He is a seasoned gas market expert, and since 2007, he also accompanied the Ukrainian work of the German Advisors Group, uh, based from uh, Berlin Economics, uh, based in Berlin Economics, uh, and. He, or last but not least, uh, was involved in low carbon Ukraine and was uh, instrumental in co implementing this. So, very warm welcome to both of you. First of all, Casimir Lorenz, you have the floor. Casimir, maybe you can give us an overview. Tell us about what it means, economically speaking, gas sector for Germany and why is it so tricky an issue? Okay, the floor is yours, sir. So you are still mute, maybe. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. It's great to join the debate and present our analysis. It's a tricky issue because uh, it has a large political dimension. You shouldn't underestimate it. Ode to the complexity of the topic, I wanted to give you a brief summary and then provide enough room for the debate or discussion. What's vital here is whenever we want to rethink gas imports and gas consumption in Europe, then we need to single out, first of all, a short term and then a long term perspective. Because this is respectively associated with different challenges. Short-term perspective is the issue that Russian gas has to be replaced on one hand because we want to avoid uh, the drain of financial funds and also alleviate the pressure in the system. And LNG, liquid uh, gas, is uh, the main avenue out route out. Our analysis showed that a uh, direct stop of the Russian gas exports would lead to a shortfall this winter in Europe. And pro unfortunately, this would even uh, drag on to the next year, even if we were to draw all options, which we deem realistic. Without being overly optimistic, we do see a uh, shortfall and that remains even if we use the LNG capacity, which are procured by the federal government and which are now also sourced by other countries. The problem is if we don't have enough gas, we need to switch off a couple of gas taps. Somebody needs to pay the bill here. And at the end of the day, probably it will be incumbent upon the industry to turn off their gas taps. And we take it that two to four ECM would uh, turn out best. Um, and if in the worst case scenario, if it's a very cold winter, let's be frank here, where weather also plays a vital role, we take it that 11 BCM could uh, lack in Germany, and that would lead to major blackouts in the industry and or shutoffs in the industry and to the macroeconomic effects that have been widely publicized. Nonetheless, it is extremely important and why is what is being done by the government, i.e. that you try to use everything 
here. LNG imports make uh, liquefied gas imports uh, possible. Here, floating terminals are really vital. Uh, Long-term and mid-term uh, brick and mortar terminals are really important. And where earlier 2040, 2024 or 2025, if you look at the whole of Europe, you will become entirely independent without any having to cut down on consumption. The second point I wanted to mention is uh, this is a short term solution. We would need uh, additional gas imports because we won't be able to switch the industry at such not short notice. Nonetheless, it is still vital that towards 2030 we adopt a different approach. We shouldn't fully bank on gas but we should fully rely on renewables. And this is something that is embraced by the German government and the European Union. In Germany, we have very ambitious goals, which go into the right direction. In the EU, we have the repower package, and uh, this has, high, again, uh, sharpened the goal or raised the bar. Uh, this, it's a big challenge. Uh, here you see a quadrupling of the historical uh, build rates. Uh, you need to achieve this challenge, uh, but this is the right approach. And in the midterm, we need to move away from Russian gas or can move away from Russian gas. Germany can't do this single-handedly. Uh, we can only do this jointly. And this, on the other hand, not only power, the power sector can be the solution here, particularly in heat and transportation and classical industry and fabrication sector, factory sector, we need to achieve the transition. And here it's vital that the renewable resources are available in Europe that allow us to waive the gas need and electrify and uh, let's recap so in the short term we see formidable challenges and we need to pull out all the bells and whistles in order to become uh, energy efficient in europe uh, that means major costs with which which we will have anyway because the imponderabilities in the gas market also lead to massive cost explosion and in the mid term 2030 we need to strongly bank on renewables only if we have massive renewables will we be able to exit gas without having to rely on other technologies like nuclear power, flood, power, uh, power plants where Germany deliberately had good reasons to wave goodbye to. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very comprehensive and compressed overview. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the discussion. And I'd like to give the floor to Georg Zachmann. We've heard about the difficulties um, with regard to using more renewables, repower EU, and we've had a fast assessment, um, but that we are also going towards the right direction. So um, is it possible to let us know about your perspective, what is possible um, uh, in a short-term perspective on the gas market? What is the EU able to do with regard to the target um, um, to cut the cash flow, or at least to reduce the cash flow, flow towards Russia? Are there any smart tools that could be used um, that are being discussed currently and how what to think of them? Thank you very much for having me. And um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit in Danish, in English and German, um, and um, about the status quo. Um, I'd like to start with Russia. Uh, since last year, they've um, uh, reduced um, its gas uh, supply. It's about two, um, we are currently, um, uh, about we are just we have we see a reduction of 50 percent and um, uh, we see that the other supplies are also in danger and they are currently using the ruble and playing with the currency it's quite in transparent who um, is supplied with gas and who is not it's not about the ruble it's about the possibility 
um, to to use political power and um, to, um, do some power playing. And of course, we are taking part in this. Unfortunate, unfortunately, a complete stop from Russia um, um, up, uh, uh, today. Um, uh, um, Kazimir talked about that this would be really difficult. Currently, we are seeing that the European storages um, are quite filled, um, um, but we have to make sure um, that what we are currently seeing, and this com still comes from Russia, so um, we talk about uh, 3.6 cubic meters and uh, six come from Russia, so this is, um, uh, so we have to work on reducing the flows when um, uh, when with regard to e uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Austria and Germany, this would be difficult to um, uh, keep um, up the storages with the same limit without having um, Russian imports. Ingrid talked about that. We pay a lot of money, huge amounts of money to Russia for energy. We talk about billions of money um, during one week, um, and it's about gas and oil. It's more than one billion per week. And the prices well, with the currency playing, um, using the quantities and uh, uncertainty, they try um, to keep it going. And we are there waiting and cannot act. So they uh, there will be a, a further continuation and it will not be enough, but we have to find a way out of this situation. And we know Russia is dependent too. They want to have the money, otherwise they would have taken another route and um, they would have... Uh, Cap the uh, the gas uh, cut off the gas supply, um, uh, and this of course we are still using their gas in order to build up the quantities in our storages. Um, so the question is what to do. And firstly, so I think the um, gas companies in Europe they have to check their contracts. Ingrid Nestler talked about that um, with the extra clauses uh, regarding the new uh, prices. So um, um, there is no margin there to act on that. So again, it's about the ruble. We have to pool all the contracts. It's not an economic game. It's not about the rule of law. It's not um, market and use acting. It's just a political game and we have to play it politically too and therefore one option could be we take we talk, take one uh, of the clauses of force majeure for example um, and then um, we offer russia something so we uh, we we take 50 uh, billion cubic meters and may give you a certain kind of money. So um, it's more than what you received in the past, but um, we talk about the uh, 85 um, per um, megawatt hour. So um, what we are currently pacing, so it's a deal with the devil, but, um, but I think it's even, but it's still better than the current situation. So um, it will work only if we can convince Russia um, that we will be able to manage without Russian gas. Otherwise, we would face the danger that they cut off uh, the gas. So we have to go through this to do this. And we have to hope that uh, other members, um, so, um, uh, and to look to, uh, towards other member states. Ingrid talked about that, the, the government of uh, Germany um, has acted, um, um, we, um, we compared to February, for example, where everybody started to look um, into our system. Uh, lots of things have happened. We've uh, talked about the Storage Act and uh, about other measures, and the Green Party has come to new decisions and changed also their uh, positions and their attitude. I think uh, we are talking about four, uh, dimensions and four layers we 
uh, we talk about the flexi flexibility that is still given within the system, even if they're quite conventional. And there is There are legislative reasons. We cannot uh, put them on the market, but we have to uh, think about them. We have to save gas. We have to talk uh, uh, about coal and uh, about the um, coal that is uh, storage. So we have to use this and um, with we have to talk about the pipeline you, um, uh, via the Pyrenees, in, uh, via Spain and France. We have to talk with um, the Netherlands from, Groning, from the Groningen field and from a German angle. It's helpful to um, think about contribution we can offer if it helps also with compromising. So maybe we can even start to rethink the nuclear question and everybody has to think about what is possible, what is doable, what is feasible. So we have to open up the discussion. We have to compromise with our partner countries when we talk to our French partners. So they um, also address the nuclear plant issue while think about the pipeline issue. So. Um, um, then, then there is a second item we have to think about. We have to think about the long-term perspe perspective. We have to uh, about. Uh, we have to talk about the German measures, and I think um, we are on a good way there. And something that is important to me: energy efficiency. We uh, have to talk with. We have to. Uh, it, um, signal the right uh, pricing um, pricings to the customers, and we have to talk to them. And um, we um, so maybe the devices that are used in households have to be um, adjusted. And so I think there is a lot of potential there. Uh, so we uh, we we have to reach those um, who have options and they have to have also some benefit from this and um, so i think there is a lot of potential there and uh, thirdly maybe um, it's possible to pool as buyers for example and um, i think we are still looking for what is doable we just still don't know what to do exactly and um, i think we are going to make a proposal soon uh, so there's the german option with the gas storage system and uh, with a bonus um, we'd like uh, we we're going to pay so we want to use uh, to organize it in a European way with a European coordination as to start to fill up the Slovenian uh, storages and then we'd like to coordinate um, uh, ourselves on the world market so if we go to Qatar so there may be one country um, that is then supplied of, um, and uh, we want to uh, be transparent we uh, to uh, have some kind of stock market, the um, THE. Um, um, so um, up to, until now, it's a little bit transparent. So there is a niche too, um, also uh, where the European Commission will be able to act. And then there is uh, another item. So um, how to this uh, to organize the distribution of gas? There is a European proposal. So maybe everybody, each country, can present a list um, of options. And um, um, but I'm afraid. I'm a little bit worried. Um, the French may say so. We continue to work with our manufacturing industries and um, and. So I think uh, to, uh, uh, market signals are uh, uh, something uh, reasonable, but maybe we can um, also uh, give some more flexibility in all, into all of this um, and then um, can um, organize the distribution and talk about savings. And when Germany, for example, um, um, maybe can also put in some money in this a pooled buying system and this could be a catalyst for accepting this uh, germany would benefit immensely from a market solution should the market implode should the shouldn't the dutch uh, 
transmit us any money um, or the French, then we, we have a problem in winter. So we have to uh, find a catalyst for the market. We have to create a common um, a project. This would help us all. And um, so this, these are, this is some food of thought uh, from a Russian perspective. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, so that was a lot of uh, food for thought uh, you picked up on. And uh, so we have a number of questions in the chat. And let me start with double checking something Kazimierz said. Possible power import or exports from Ukraine and to Germany uh, in order to help us out. I mean, that's what uh, the Vice Minister mentioned, um, Deputy Minister mentioned as an option. And uh, how realistic is it? And what are the preconditions that you need? And within which deadline is that possible? Thank you for the question. It's an interesting proposal. It has major technical challenges. We also had uh, synchronization of uh, the Ukrainian grid with the European grid. In theory, it would be possible, practically. There are many challenges that we need to master first. So in terms of production capacity in Europe. We have quite something. This is what my colleague already mentioned. So we have a lot of capacity which are already in place. The problem is that coal-fired power plants, especially in Germany, and especially if we don't want to question the exit 2030, then we have a lot of capacity which are not going to work overnight, but many of them are still up and running. So we wouldn't have to switch them off or reactivate old capacity, old resources. Uh, here there is the legislation that was mentioned from the German government. I think this is a very symbolic uh, proposal and we shouldn't underestimate it. What's important, we need different power production. Uh, gas uh, consumption doesn't take uh, place in power, but heat and energy. So even if we could decarbonize power, because we haven't electrified the other sectors, we only have a limited lever here. And therefore it's important to displace the gas production, which we have right now from the, uh, from the market, especially when it comes to gas heat production. So that uh, this is an area where with the legislation I think is thinking about the gas input. So we're not doing this within the meaning of uh, the bill, which was presented in the media. We think it will only be, um, implemented if there will be such a coal import. So it's been mentioned, we have a quantity problem. We can't store enough. Anything that we store safe now will be saved for um, uh, for the for for the period of an import stop. And uh, so therefore maybe you should start now and come up with political bartering power. Yes, thank you. That seems to be a pivotal point. Uh, Ingrid and Georg Sachmann also pointed out uh, the question of flexibility and the scope for efficiency. This is what a couple of questions want to know in the chat. What do we use industrial gas for production of one-way bottles? Is that so clever? Or the production of plastic for packaging? for wrapping. I mean, Germany, compared to other EU countries, consumes much more plastic than other EU countries. So isn't that something that is obvious, where we can really uh, generate lots of efficiencies in terms of gas as a resource? And Georg Zachmann, so a question to you. 
Is it the price signal that is the sole uh, steering tool uh, that is fit for purpose? Or do we need political control or management? What is being switched off first or shut off first? Or which production or which gas input should be phased out first when it comes to certain chemicals that we want to remove in the midterm anyway as part of the respective reach uh, regulation in the EU? within the meaning of a closely, uh, closed loop economy. So don't we need political management or shall we leave it to the power of the market? I mean, that was something I would like to double check with you, but I understood you, uh, that actually you also wanted to comment on uh, the power Ukraine question. As part of the last project, we looked at the synchronization and the, here we're seeing really fast progress. I think today uh, Poland said they want to open the wash up line again. And this is a 750 kV uh, line. This is really massive and Polish is impressive in the crisis. So anyone who's looking at the Ukrainian crisis see this everywhere, even in the uh, energy crisis. There's something Poland never wanted to do, uh, buying energy from Ukraine because they destroyed their own market by that. But here you can see how proactively a country can behave in, so, in the midst of such a crisis. Here, all lobbies are pushed aside because they know uh, it helps Ukraine. They can earn money if they export power, and it helps us resolve the energy problems in the short term. So they adopt a very pragmatic approach. And I went to Warsaw the other week, and their outlook on the world is completely different to what we see in Germany, i.e. in terms of what's feasible, what's not feasible. And here, I think uh, we can really be inspired in the German debate when it comes to Poland and their role model. Uh, let's talk about the market. Well, I think it's going to be very fragmented. Well, I'm sure Ingrid uh, is much more savvy here. Uh, when it comes to the Federal Network Agency, the regulators, maybe they need to decide, uh, the lawyers need to decide what will be switched off first. And I can't really imagine that it's going to be very efficient that uh, you, uh, you know, have lawyers translate what was written in a bill and they should translate it into a list. I don't think it's going to be so efficient here. I, I think we've got lots of twilight zones. I don't even want to imagine. I think a market-based solution would be much cleaner, much neater, because I'm sure the result would be more efficient. And if uh, we have a company which still produces methanol with, uh, new, uh, with natural gas, and if they see it as a more favorable price in the US, then they're going to try and buy it. And uh, are the companies know what is written in our long-term goals. And if the prices are high enough, then I think, well, well I think one problem was that the price signals didn't hit home with, uh, many companies because they had long-term supply contracts, hedging contracts, and here politicians need to uh, create a secure playing field, how it looks like with, or what it looks like with gas supplies in the future. And it's got probably going to be possible to get the gas again for 50 megawatts, uh, 15 euro per, per megawatt hour. And at that rate, it's going to be easier to look after the gas supply for companies. OK, I suggest we get Ingrid back on board because there were many buzzwords which specifically went to politicians. Politicians should help steer and manage this process when it comes to gas flexibility, tapping the flexibility in the gas market. And uh, so therefore the question is political control management versus uh, price-based control. Ingrid, how does this tally? How can we combine this? Okay, let me preface this, that the federal uh, network agency, we don't just have lawyers, we have different disciplines, also economic engineers who are also savvy in terms of economy, not just laws, but we all 
uh, agree that we should never leave it to the federal network agency, the regulator to decide this. They are preparing uh, just in case the market cannot resolve this and uh, just in case something has to happen and, um, you know, the market won't be enough and the gas uh, needs to be prioritized and therefore we can't rule out that uh, this situation will happen and therefore we try to prepare ourselves best as we may but i uh, fully agree we need to avoid that scenario and i do think that market mechanisms are not so good but they need to fully be further developed and uh, therefore um, well, uh, subjectively, we are preparing uh, an anti-Putin uh, economic war law every month. Um, but I think it will be one of the pivotal questions how we uh, carry on with the gas market development. So, uh, with regard to the questions being raised in the chat, I'd like to talk a little talk a little bit further about the LNG question. So the framing, the legal framing that has passed as a bill foresees quite a high number of new LNG terminals. Uh, what about the danger that we be when we get into a new kind of dependency knowingly and knowing that um, it requires um, a lot of investment and it has to be profitable, isn't this a contradiction uh, uh, with, uh, with regard to our decarbonization targets and um, with regard to uh, natural gas um, and uh, in order to uh, get independent um, of this uh, in manufacturing industries. Mr. Lorenz, maybe you'd like to give us some input and Georg Zachmann too. I think this is a, quite an important a question. So in, um, um, being a little bit provocative, um, what is the alternative? Um, um, so if we don't uh, raise these terminals uh, or the floating terminals, we, I think we think we need both of them. Um, and w this wouldn't help us with becoming uh, independent if uh, we'll need them in the next 10 years, maybe even in, in the next uh, 30 years. The important um, consideration is uh, what is behind it. There are the terminals where the gas arrives, and then we have the supply contracts that, and we have to have to get the gas and we need it uh, on the short term. There are spot markets and Europe try, is currently trying um, to buy the available gas. So the pricing is really high. We have to pay uh, and there is no other gas being available. Um, it's about the flexibility of the LNG production, but it's also limited. It cannot be increased on a short term basis. Um, um, on a, um, uh, but it may be possible in the future that it will be uh, in, um, bigger. But is only focusing on the spot market, it's too dangerous. I think we need also contracts on a, a long-term basis and, um, and um, we have to think about the contracts, how um, they are being made and uh, with regard to the dependency and we have to think about hydrogen and we have to redirect uh, towards this direction. So, um, uh, I think Mr. Zachmann also wants to contribute. And so, Mr. Zachmann, Georg Zachmann, maybe you can also give us some more insights uh, with uh, hydrogen and compatibility. And it's always being addressed during discussions. And it's also um, here mentioned in the chat. 
so Casimir Lorenz made it quite clear. Um, so um, we have um, to um, do something. We have to overcome this uh, barrier, and um, we, uh, maybe we have to even use things we uh, don't want to um, uh, use. Really, we're talking about these floating terminals and um, where to anchor those, and um, do we want them all in the northern sea? Or, or does it help to have to um, have to have a more European side to have more of them in the Baltic Sea or in the Mediterranean Sea? So, with regard to the LNG terminals, in the past we've always tried to um, uh, uh, procure a complete infrastructure with including a supplying contract and. I've always thought this is a mistake. Um, we um, uh, we tried to not have too much and to not have redundancies. Uh, the Capelda terminals, which was being raised as an empty terminal, and we, then uh, Russian gas was still being used and imported, but there was this backup. It had been in with the Baltic seas. It um, had been quite a expensive but it was worth a while as we've seen now and i'm convinced when it comes to stable terminals um, i'm opposed to that uh, the numbers that are uh, currently being um, circulated uh, one to one match doesn't make uh, any sense but i think we will have a lower demand the pricing will um, keep up and but i think there will uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, less demand with regard to gas it doesn't make any sense that the manufacturing Manufacturers uh, use um, um, uh, gas that is four times more expensive compared to the United States. So we can, of course, uh, um, subsidize this, but we'll, this will be really, really expensive. And I think uh, no country will want uh, will want this. So um, we have to talk about carbon industries um, or those that are really, really intensive with regard to. Uh, energy. I think they will leave Europe, and and what will what what happens then with the energy pressure groups? And maybe they'll ask to bridge this gap in the next five years. Um, uh, until uh, then, hydrogen uh, will be um, then uh, helping out. It's about a political decision, but. Um, I, um, I I I think we'll have to see what economists say with regard to this. And when it comes to the hydrogen, yes, it, it will be used in some branches, um, and uh, but it, it will depend on the sector and and the economists. I think they agree. So where will it be able to use it? Where uh, will it? Um, um, enter and what about the quantities? Do we need huge quantities? Um, less convinced than what we see in the German discourse and the debate. Uh, so I think we we have to think about the next two winters. What happens with the electrification in the heat system in in the heat sector and. Um, and um, with the manufacturers and the manufacturing industry, uh, hydrogen is it a huge topic? And um, and uh, thinking about thousand terawatts uh, per hour, I don't believe in that. So last question, Mayo oh, uh, Mithen. Um, what about its role and? And I'd like also to add the higher pricing. How do they change our time frame regarding the introduction of alternatives, as there are hydrogen or um, other um, others, and um, so they will be more profitable profitable because of the higher pricing um, is there a possibility of acceleration um, anybody anybody likes to address this yes maybe um, um, yeah i can um, can comment on this biomethane of course is 
is a topic. Um, it, it's been um, generated decentrally, and um, but we need more infrastructure in order to use it better. Denmark is a more advanced um, a fifth. Um, and they um they have as a value but they they want to uh, go up to one fourth but they have a higher gas um, consumption and everything based on biomass this is a different debate a different discussion we are also talking about uh, food um, security so uh, sustainable sustainability is uh, a, a topic so I agree, I coincide, we shouldn't look towards a world we don't have gas, we have to work with biogas or hydrogen, we um, have to think about the pricing, um, um, maybe we should use them less, um, but it, it's, it can be an additional solution, solution, but it cannot be the absolute or complete solution. When it, with um, long-term solutions and investments, when we talk about electrification of different sectors, so, so the heat sector, there is again a huge sec um, possibility for flexibility and we need it in the electricity sector. And again, we talk about the renewables here. So how much, hydrogen we will use, how much biomethane we will use. So there's a lot of need for debate. There are very different opinions there. And the government, the national government and has an opinion, but uh, the uh, companies, they have um, different attitude. Um, um, so, and the debate is still open with regard to the hydrogen. I think it's, it will be quite interesting. And just uh, another, uh, is Georg Zachmann, is there anything else? You, no, no, okay. So thank you so much um, for this part. Uh, thank you very much, Georg and Kazimir. And I'd like to move on and we'll have a third part. And um, here, we'd like to exchange, to have an exchange about politics and the economy again. And I'd like to um, say hello to Yevgenia Zadzaku. She's uh, responsible for the climate protection and mobility and transport uh, department uh, within Eco Action and. Um, uh, in Ukraine, um, it's one of the leading um, uh, um, NGOs in Ukraine in this sector. And um, thank you so much for the keynote. Um, and uh, you uh, triggered this. Um, um, and, um, and then I'd like to welcome uh, Olena Osmolovska. Uh, she's the director of the reform support team at the Ministry of Energy uh, of Ukraine since 2021. And, and she worked in different roles uh, with Naftogaz in a, in a uh, managerial role. Um, and for example, so a warm welcome to both of you. And uh, Ingrid Nesner will continue to be with us. So I'd like to give the floor to Yevgenia Zastyatko. Eco-action. Eco-action tried to form a coalition of different groups of civil society and um, there is an alliance now consisting of 45 organizations uh, and the international stand with you Ukraine campaign was started uh, um, addressing globally uh, um, this issue supported by international organizations in order to stop 
uh, imports, oil and gas imports from Russia. Maybe we could start with your keynote um, and you could present your ideas and, and maybe also um, have a glance at the practical problems that may raise. We've talked already about some of them, the consequences uh, in in practical life, when we want to reduce our gas dependency, um, we are facing different dilemmas. The question has been raised, has been mentioned that we have to maybe orient ourselves more towards coal again uh, when we want to, should we want to reduce our dependency um, uh, from gas. So please, the floor is yours. We are open to your comments and questions. Good afternoon. Thank you. Guten Tag. Guten Abend. Vielen Dank. Uh, can you hear me now? Because I think I heard the German translation. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay, thank that's fine. You. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm a representative of Eco Action. It's the biggest environmental NGO. And yes, we worked with the climate policy, climate change issue. We tried to raise uh, climate uh, ambition in Ukraine. And we actually been, uh, like Ukraine, been uh, very uh, like moved forward with this during the last years, but unfortunately now the war changed uh, the uh, prioritization and uh, the climate is now not a priority for us, but we see like after the war, a war started, we actually see the potential of uh, that experience that we had before uh, to use it like now to help to support, to stop this war. Uh, so that's why uh, together with uh, uh, environmental and not only in in Ukraine, uh, in the EU and like all around the world was created this initiative stand with Ukraine and there's been like a lot of also coalition support. Uh, but I would stop about uh, this initiative uh, stand with Ukraine because tomorrow is actually 100 days when in Ukraine is happening war. Uh, and that's why uh, this uh, coalition is, uh, initiative is going to release a, a statement uh, with demands. Uh, like uh, actually first uh, statement been released during the first uh, like weeks uh, of the war, like after we created this coalition. And now this uh, coalition is supporting more than uh, 800 organizations all around the world from 60 countries. So it's a huge support from all over the world, which is important because Russia have a connection not only with EU, but with Asia, with US. And so it's important to actually um, show the world who Russia is. Uh, but uh, in the first events, we also asked to um, uh, stop all trades and, uh, and inv investments in energy company. And actually our demands didn't change a lot from that time. Uh, so it's still uh, clear that uh, it's important to complete that immediate ban on Russia, put the uh, uh, ban on Russian oil, gas, and coal, as well as a sanction against uh, Russian nuclear sector that will uh, accelerate the clean energy transition globally. Uh, secondary uh, sanction on uh, all buyers uh, of Russian fossils, including buyers outside of the sanction coalition countries, uh, foreign uh, shipping companies and uh, refines. And uh, what's also important uh, in the way that we also worked with the climate and we always stand for the uh, green transition, just transition. It's now important immediate clean energy transition, rapidly accelerated investment in development of energy efficiency and energy saving uh, measure across EU, but not only also you like around the world too. Uh, so it would actually help us to uh, 
help Ukraine to stop the war and uh, in the future also like uh, not to see the huge con consequences from the climate change. Uh, so actually uh, this fight is uh, from both sides and actually fossil fuel is like uh, the resource uh, for both huge consequences that we see now in, in Ukraine and climate change. So it's important to have this direction on uh, green transition, energy efficiency, and especially like for you, for Germany, I think it would be like possible and um, you can be as example for the uh, a lot of countries partnership uh, with who you also work. Uh, why it's uh, important and why uh, how it's possible. Uh, uh, it's important not to switch to other energy uh, directions, uh, other regions who is going to like can support you and Germany to actually uh, extend their dependence on uh, fossil fuel uh, because it can actually escalate the situation with other regions so like with dictatorship countries uh, uh, so it's important not to support such regimes and again one of the solution is green transition another point why it's important uh, with a secondary that i mentioned about uh, companies actually in 2021 a lot of uh, energy companies had a profit a huge profit due, uh, during the year like a billions um, and actually even now kremlin uh, already mentioned so during this year they expecting to have a profit around uh, 14 billion until the end of the year. So actually, uh, this energy company is making a lot of profits uh, and it's continued to support like the, the war in Ukraine escalation and um, all this decision, which is like making and prolonging. Uh, it's actually means that every day is like in Ukraine, is, somebody is going to die. Uh, like between the sanction in uh, between the fifth package of sanction and uh, sixth uh, package of sanctions pass uh, 54 days, uh, like tomorrow is 100 days. So it's like uh, during such period, such uh, devastating uh, war, it's important to like uh, have um, right and quick decision to actually not to support such regime and stop this war as fast as possible. I would probably stop here. Maybe there are some questions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, many thanks, uh, Evgenia, uh, for, for this perspective. Um, uh, I would go next to uh, Olena Osmalowska. Uh, I'll come also to, to you. Um, yeah, um, we have heard already quite, uh, uh, quite a lot from uh, Mr. Demchenkov, um, um, comprehensive uh, um, perspective from, from side of the Ukrainian government. Uh, I would still um, e come, come back to you uh, with, with the question on, uh, um yeah efficiency of of um, um the existing uh sanctions regime on uh in terms of uh impact on uh on the russian economy and on the on the russian um uh, ability to to um to go on with this with this war um the, the uh, german minister for um uh, economy and and uh, climate uh, um, protection today said that it's uh, so embarrassing that Germany is still uh, buying Russian oil and gas, um, and and uh, this needs to be ended as soon as possible. Um, at the same time, uh, we we still have an effect uh, of the sanctions. Uh, that's what he he observes. Um, and uh, the fortunately, we see already the the effect that um, um, Russia's ability to buy um, uh, 
products from, from the world market is, is limited. Um, so are, are we on the, um, in, on, on the right direction here on this track? And, and uh, what would be the, um, well, the, the potential instruments that, that you would like to see um, uh, here uh, to, to make it more uh, effective and, and efficient, you know, facing the circumstances of the difficult uh, difficulties that, that we have in particular on the gas market. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Robert, and thank you, colleagues. I'm conscious of time, uh, and uh, I will try to keep my uh, presentation as short as possible. Uh, speaking of uh, whether the sanctions are working, uh, we can see uh, that Russia's uh, state budget income from uh, oil and gas taxes has increased 40% year over year in the first four months of uh, uh, this year. So uh, indeed, they are very much uh, benefiting from the extraordinarily high uh, prices for oil and gas. Um, oil is more important uh, than gas in terms of income. Uh, oil generates 80% of Russian uh, oil and gas uh, budget income. So we are very, uh, we, we welcome very much the uh, decision to, uh, uh, by John, Germany to voluntarily stop buying pipeline oil um, in, by the beginning, by, by the end of the year. Uh, because uh, three countries in Europe, Poland, Netherlands, and Germany uh, buy as much oil as China uh, does from Russia. And uh, if these uh, three countries uh, say no to Russian pipeline oil, this will be a major blow to uh, the income that uh, Russia is collecting from, uh, from its oil trade. Uh, speaking of gas, it's more difficult to uh, uh, say no, to stop buying. And uh, there are very specific reasons why this is so difficult. So I'm here, I'm showing on the slide a, uh, a reality uh, check, so to say, in the uh, gas market uh, uh, um, integration in Europe. Uh, this uh, area, which is marked on the map, we call Baumgarten area because of the uh, hub in the center, Baumgarten in Austria. Uh, why, what makes it so special? It's uh, the uh, areas, uh, the regions in the, the European gas network, which are dependent on uh, physical Russian gas. Uh, this area is very poorly interconnected with the other areas. And uh, it's not common, uh, it's not often uh, looked at uh, the regional basis because people normally look at the interconnection between the country borders. But the fact is that we have very serious limitations and bottlenecks within some countries. And Germany is one of them. So you probably have heard that there is Northern Germany and Southern Germany in terms of gas market. And uh, that's not just a, uh, a designation. There is really very poor connection between the two parts of German network. It's only about five or six BCM uh, uh, billion cubic meters in capacity uh, to transfer gas from north to south. And uh, south, as we see on this map, Bayern and Baden-Württemberg, th these are two uh, regions in Germany which are very much dependent on the physical supplies of Russian gas. Uh, what can be done with this? Uh, there are two entry points into this area of uh, large capacity, of the capacity which is needed. Uh, the uh, first traditional entry point was through Ukraine, uh, Slovakia and Austria, which brought this gas to Germany and, this, and the northeastern uh, France. The second entry point uh, appeared with the construction of Nord Stream 1, and uh, Nord Stream 1 is the uh, uh, underwater pipeline, which brings gas to, uh, uh, to the connection point in Greifswald. And, uh, this, and, and from there, gas travels through the pipeline Opal. And there is now additional pipeline Oigal. These two pipelines on the ground, they connect the sea with the south of Germany. 
And what we are saying to the German government as well, if you want to get rid of dependence on Russian gas, you need to, first of all, solve the issue of the southern part of your country, because this is where you do not have many alternatives and it's very difficult to deliver other gas. And this is in the same time also a solution because this, these two pipelines of Holland Oigel, they do not belong to Gazprom. They belong to a consortium of uh, European companies. Uh, Gazprom used to be one of the holders in, the, in this consortium, a, a minority holder. Now that Gazprom Germania is in the custody of uh, Binet's uh, Agentur, uh, the uh, uh, German government together with the other partners, they have a full control of this piece of infrastructure. So if we, if we can now turn to the next slide, please. Uh, this is what we are here. There are two pro projects of uh, LNG terminals for Germany, one in uh, Wilhelmshaven and the other in, is in Brunsbüttel. Uh, these projects are uh, connected to the northern part of German network. So even if they uh, provide additional access to some new uh, suppliers of gas for Germany, uh, they, first of all, service the northern part of, of Germany, which is already pretty well connected to alternative suppliers. And secondly, they will be competing with uh, other terminals in the uh, in, in Netherlands, Belgium and, and in, in, in that sea. However, what we are uh, suggesting to the German government is to consider putting an LNG terminal near Lubmin, near Greifswald. Uh, wherever the uh, uh, seabed allows, uh, so that this LNG gas is delivered via Opal and Oigel right to the south of Germany, uh, Czech Republic, Austria, Northern Italy, Slovakia, eventually Ukraine, Moldova and Romania. So these countries which are dependent on physical supplies of uh, molecules from Russia, they can uh, have access to alternative gas through this terminal in Lubman. So if we, if you would ask me uh, what would be one single uh, action which would uh, change the situation most, this probably would be it. The connection of the existing very powerful pipelines uh, which lead, uh, which drive gas to the southern uh, part of Germany to a new LNG terminal. If we are talking about uh, investments and stranded investments, and uh, if it's going to be lock, locked in uh, to gas instead of changes to ch changing to something else uh, greener in the future, the investment into such a terminal compared to what Germany is paying now for Russian gas, it, it's like months probably of, uh, of payments. It's, uh, it's, it's not a, that huge of investment. It will be uh, paying off pretty quickly. Um, in terms of uh, other actions, uh, we, could, we also suggested that while you are working on such solutions and diversifying physical supplies, you could also, uh, in, as a state, introduce uh, some financial restrictions on how much money Russia is getting from its uh, trade in oil and gas. The simplest option would be the uh, uh, Levi, a, a duty on imported uh, uh, oil and gas from Russia. If you continue to buy gas until the, uh, to buy oil from Russia until the year end, a duty could be introduced uh, to make sure that Russia gets smaller amounts uh, of cash um, for the same uh, volumes of oil. With oil, the situation is potentially more difficult because uh, Russia could uh, shift oil to some other markets, uh, which would cost also additional transportation costs. Uh, with gas, the situation is straightforward. Russia cannot deliver this gas to anywhere else but the European market. It doesn't have uh, capacity of uh, uh, reworking this gas within Russia, at least not in the short term. It doesn't have a pipeline to China. Its capacity to convert this gas into uh, LNG and ship it by the sea is very limited. So Russia is more dependent on Europe in terms of uh, gas than Europe is dependent on Russia. Um, if uh, Europe decides to act in a coordinated manner and uh, say that we, we are buying this gas on a centralized basis, then Europe will be able to put out conditions uh, of uh, whatever you see uh, 
um, suitable. Uh, as Georg said, uh, this uh, would be an option to, uh, uh, to, to dictate prices and conditions to Russia, to Gazprom, in terms of how and where Europe would like to get its gas. So these uh, actions in a nutshell would uh, uh, be much, would, would bring this effect of uh, stripping Russian budget of these super huge uh, uh, revenues from oil and gas trading. And uh, they would not undermine security of uh, Germany or other states of the European Union. Thank you. I'm ready to take the questions. Okay, yeah, um, thank you very much for, for this perspective that adds quite well complements to, to the uh, previous um, inputs from uh, Georg Zachmann and um, Kazimir Lorenz, yeah, uh, very well adds to, to this picture. Um, still, I would like to come back in the remaining few minutes that, that we have um, to to the to the question of, of how to create and uh, how to uh, yeah use this momentum that we have and how to how to uh, start really the um, uh, uh, the the transition uh, and the the um, the path to uh, reduction of of consumption of gas consumption um, and to um yeah to uh, to to raise efficiency uh of the the gas uh, uh, co uh consumption and and uh, utilization yeah um and because this kind of uh, needs uh, readiness also in in the societies not only in germany but actually all over europe yeah to to uh, accelerate the, the green transition this is what also uh, evgenia talked about yeah and um, so um, this is yeah maybe also something an uh, in, in issue where, where ingrid can come in again um, uh, Und ich wechsle noch mal wieder ins, ins Deutsche. And I'd like uh, maybe uh, to continue in German. Ingrid, what do you think about the atmosphere in Germany? What is the tendency, the trends? Um, um, you mentioned um, the ideas that are still um, missing, the momentum we are missing, where do we find the drivers to get things done and to get cracking? Where can we start to reduce or can we continue to reduce our gas consumption? So this is a topic with lots of layers it's a political issue we're working on that um, when we um, when we talk about the refurbishing of um, buildings of housing so we have to start with those that are less insulated um, this uh, is something we have to negotiate and um, is, this is also something that belongs to the compensation package there uh, is the possibility to use subsidies um, that in the manufacturing industry there is already something being done um, um, with regard to efficiency and, but we see that this has been increased. This is also induced by the higher gas prices, but it's also about uh, each individual. Um, and we've heard about the use of plastics. And so um, this is a part we cannot um, work with um, certain political um, measures and um, we cannot ban packages and, and the wrapping of food so each individual each consumer can make their decisions you can um, buy food that is not wrapped up and um, we can reduce our electricity use we cannot not use we can not use our, um, our cars so there was a question in the chat. We have to think 
about really strict measures. We talk about compensation packages, comp compensation package number two, for example. The prices will continue to go up um, and they haven't still reached the consumers. So there is st still something that will come at the consumers, um, which has been triggered by uh, Putin's decision. So there is a price to pay and um, we'll face a situation. We, um, we will not be able to compensate it all. Politics uh, will try to give answers, of course, and especially when the price will become really, really um, expensive. But each individual, we all have to work on this. Um, um, we've seen it at the beginning, but maybe it has slowed down in between so we have also a certain normalcy and we think maybe a little bit less about that so we've heard about a lot of advices by the ministries given to us how to reduce energy consumption i don't know if it's enough i think we need all the actors on board the manufacturers for example they um, rely on energy but it's but it's also about the consumers and we've heard about the um uh, conservationists, um, they, so we have to really, really name it. Uh, and why don't we do that enough? Ms. Minister Habeck has been at the forefront um, on telly. He's, he has said it's um, necessary and it will help. And um, so we need, but we need more actors who will pass on this message. Thank you so much for your perspective and for your hints um, with regard to motorists and to car driving. We don't even have a cap on this um, on speed and on German motorways. So this could be quite an easy to implement measure in order to reduce also oil consum consumption. So. Um, there are maybe too many involved and it's difficult to find a solution. Yevgenia, what about you? What do you think uh, with regard to civil society, the European civil society? We have this uh, large coalition that has been formed. How can they help to drive this momentum uh, or to create and generate this momentum and um, how can they mobilize the society and at the same time i'd like to um, add um, we are we have to make it um, sweet and simple <laughs> um, so uh, you can also of course comment on on other aspects that have been mentioned uh, uh, Ms. Osmolovska will also have um, her time, and then we'll have, of course, uh, to wrap it up. Yevgenia, you've got the floor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think like civil society has also always played uh, team player as a like raising ambition. Plus, uh, they also help to raise awareness about different stuff, which is actually also helping to reach different goals. From, uh, from the perspective of energy efficiency, reducing consumptions, uh, uh, I don't know, plastic and that, I think we just uh, now is uh, raising the con consumption in EU and uh, probably a lot of like, everybody is now that actually like uh, Western, like more developing the country are consuming more resources. So, so actually it's important to show the connection uh, about this uh, but unfortunately for this it's usually like uh, a huge time consuming so it would be important to also have a uh, legislation support uh, from the government which is also would be like pushing and civil society also can play a role in this process to create like, a fair uh, process to um, to find the solution uh, to be a part of uh, communication discussion and uh, like uh, just from ukrainian side unfortunately we need it like very quick uh, because like uh, we are afraid like for how long this work could continue and how many losses we are going to have uh, in future so that's why 
uh, from one side you are ready to participate and do from our side uh, whatever it needs. Uh, it's not uh, not not only from Ukrainian side but so all, all civil society. And I think like during the last years from 2018 when all ready for future movement and other movements, it's actually raised a lot of ambition like uh, all over the world. Uh, plus we saw like a great change. Uh, uh, you know, during the German uh, election, the discussion about Green Deal, uh, climate targets, so it's it's important. And actually now this war is only gave us one more reason to be more proactive and uh, quick, uh, like rapidly active, uh, be active in uh, uh, the situation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Eugenia. And then uh, over to uh, Aliona Osnolowska again um, for thank you very the much, final uh, conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Robert, and thank you, colleagues, for, uh, for the readiness to uh, discuss what Germany can do and even the readiness to take some pain uh, uh, for, uh, for the regular common German uh, citizens and household. But I would like to say that not all the solutions which would hurt Putin require pain from the German household. The uh, ideas which uh, Gerd Sachmann, for instance, described, uh, described uh, the uh, uh, single buyer from Russia or the leave, the, 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 the taxing of the Russian energy could provide money to the European governments, to the German government to uh, support the households or to support uh, uh, suppliers to households so that you did, did not have to pay more. Because the problem is not that the uh, gas is getting more expensive to produce. The problem is that Putin wants you to pay more to get money to finance the war in Ukraine. Uh, Europe is in power to impose its conditions on Putin and to uh, pay less, uh, to save money, to, to to either lower the price of uh, oil and gas in the European Union or to uh, provide compensations to those consumers who cannot pay more. So this is, this is not a solution which requires only the measures on behalf of households. This is a policy solution which requires action from the governments, from the uh, European Commission, and uh, they can be very well accepted by the, uh, by the public, I believe. Because this is fair, you do not have to suffer for something which other people are doing, and you can put the uh, you know the blame and the and the action to hurt those who are to blame. I mean, who 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 are the uh, the doing the bad thing? It's uh, it's really up to the governments to take this action. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Olena. Uh, thank you for your summary and your comment. And I think it's really important to emphasize this as a result of our debate tonight. I think the debate has shown us there are still options that are viable so uh, we cannot start to relax and chill saying oh we're already doing a lot of things and uh, the debate has shown us there is still a lot uh, we can change and it's urgent we have to act quickly and we have to implement new measures and other measures because this horrible war continues each day and um, and there is not an absolute immediate link between reduction of gas imports, but there is there is a link there, um, an immediate link, so to say. And so we come to the conclusion, we are able to do more in order to save more energy. And the earlier, the sooner we start, the better it is. And, um, and the better we will manage the scarcity of gas and the cheaper it will be or the less expensive it will be for us. But we have also addressed other aspects and I liked um, what we've heard from Mr. Den uh, Denchek um, to have um, 
to have some kind of summary. Mr. Demchenkov um, mentioned this. Uh, maybe we can, can put something together and use it as inspiration, as ideas for um, a further debate. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, Ingrid Nestle would like to add. So uh, it's I maybe we could also uh, we could do something more in order to give less money to Putin. So uh, uh, Mr. Zachman has um, driven it to the point. It's about power playing and um, what we're seeing. And the question is that are we in the position to be credible um, or to have the credibility towards Putin that we are um, able to manage uh, without its gas, um, without Russia's gas, uh, it won't be that easy. But um, we are very, in, um, we are very interested in continue to debate this. So I think that is uh, um, a lot of need to continue to discuss this. I think it's really necessary. So. Um, uh, we, we are going to take this into account. Thank you so much for your patience. More than two hours remote um, conferencing is very intense. And um, I'd like to apologize, uh, but I think the discussion was really, really helpful. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you um, to Tanya and Rosvita for their help and support tonight. Thank you for um, supporting us and for enabling um, this discussion. Um, so there uh, uh, will be a link um, to um, the recorded conference, um, to the recorded version of this conference. So again, um, thank you so much for all your keynotes, for all your input. Um, I wish you all the best. Have a lovely evening. Thank you.